Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our uh, event. Uh, this is Fantasizing Racism with Todd McGowan. Uh, this uh, webinar is scheduled to run from uh, 4 to 5.30 to allow ample time for uh, Q&A at the end. Um, we're just going to, to begin right away. So I'll, I will introduce uh, our speaker, Todd McGowan, Professor of English and Film Studies at the University of Vermont is a well-regarded psychoanalytic film theorist and scholar of Freud, Lacan, Hegel, Marx, Zizek, and others. He regularly writes about capitalism, political theory, popular culture, and comedy. His many books include Universality and Identity Politics, 2020, Emancipation After Hegel, Achieving a Contradictory Revolution from 2019, Only a Joke Can Save Us, A Theory of Comedy, Capitalism and Desire, The Psychic Cost of Three Markets, Psychoanalytic Film Theory and the Rules of the Game, Spike Lee, Enjoying What We Don't Have, The Fictional Christopher Nolan, Out of Time, The Impossible David Lynch, and The End of Dissatisfaction, Jacques Lacan and the Emerging Society of Enjoyment. Todd is also the founding organizer of the LAC Conference, an annual meeting of mainly Lacanian scholars and theorists that regularly feature excellent panelists and keynote speakers. Uh, next year, LAC is going to be at the University of at Vermont, on uh, April 28th to 30th, and we'll feature Maladin Delar. Uh, the subject of McGowan's work, uh, the subjects of McGowan's work, emancipatory affirmation of the universal, the parasitism of capitalism and our capacity to enjoy, the importance of misunderstanding as a way to knowledge, the salvific function of jokes and the oppression of the particular in discourses of identity are all marked by an urgency and timeliness that make them impossible in a sense, either to overlook or to take seriously enough. Hence the great difficulty, which renders all the more profound the courage, humanity, and rigor of Todd's treatment of them. In Emancipation After Hegel, for instance, he tells a story that illustrates the difference between Hegel and Heidegger in terms of an important life choice. Hegel, uh, Todd informs us, spent a decade of his career outside the university writing for newspapers and working as a, a gymnasium rector before he taught at university. After uh, publishing Science of Logic and the Encyclopedia, Hegel gained a position at the University of Heidelberg in 1816. And then a year later, he answered the call to teach at Humboldt University in Berlin in major and prestigious post. Rather than being a, a sellout or romanticizing his outsider status, Hegel decided deliberately to go from the margins to the center because following this ambitious path meant he was unwilling to compromise on his desire to circulate his philosophy to the widest possible audience. As Todd puts it, Hegel uh, was here um, making, making an important uh, claim which would be central also to his work. Uh, the, and here's a quote, freedom does not consist in fighting against some dominant external power, but in recognizing that the subject must provide the ground for its own act. By becoming a philosophical authority and disseminating his work to the largest possible audience, uh, Hegel was able to recognize the inherent subjective division of occupying this position and to make that also available for others to, to notice. By allowing himself to bear the ludicrous weight of what it meant to be an authority, Hegel exposed himself to criticism, to parody, to misrecognition and misreading and also to the recognition that his position as master is insubstantial even as he occupies it. By contrast, Heidegger remained aloof and retreated into the Black Forest instead of taking his call to teach at Berlin. He therefore retreated from his desire and kept in the process the illusion in place that the authority, the position of authority was sacred. Refusing to occupy a position that would make him a parody or expose his frailty, he kept abreast of prestige even while accruing it in the background. Todd's path is like Hegel's, and I permit the full range of this comparison with all the risk of its absurdity. Todd does not back away from the position of speaking to a large audience on matters that are of essential import to them, refusing to concede that the ludicrousness of such an address is any reason not to dare to make it. The spirit of Todd's intervention is therefore courageous in a manner that fittingly occupies the center even as it does not forget that it came from the margins. And I would venture that it is precisely in this spirit in which he will address us this evening. I'd like to give a special thanks to the Society of Fellows, 
the MALS program, the English department, the film and media studies department, the Asian societies, cultures and languages program and the psychoanalysis study group for their support and help in publicizing this event. Please join us in welcoming Todd McGowan for Fantasizing Racism. <laughs> Jamie, thanks so much. I've never been compared to Hegel before, so that was really that was very nice. And I I have to say one thing though. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Rick Richard Boothby, who's a, also a psychoanalytic theorist, said that I would never take my own advice. That I love I like Heidegger. I love staying in the wilderness in Vermont, and wouldn't if I got the call to some more prestigious university, I wouldn't take it. And that's true. So I I, I wouldn't follow my own advice. So that's, uh, I'm a little bit, I, I don't, I don't think I deserve your, I, I'm not, I'm not worthy of your comparison in more than one way. Uh, but, but thanks. Nonetheless, I, 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 I appreciate it. Uh, so I want to talk today about uh, the way that fantasy works in the dissemination of racism. And, and first, I want to talk a little bit about the structure of fantasy. So my idea is that fantasy provides a narrative structure that gives us access to what would other, otherwise be inaccessible. So some enjoyment that we couldn't have without the fantasy structure we get through fantasy. And we rely, I, I, you might say we rely on fantasy to do the dirty work of the libido to give us a way to relate to what we desire. So fantasy gives us a scenario that offers an unconscious pathway. So sometimes parts of fantasy can be conscious, but the, the pathway that it offers us to how we enjoy is unconscious and it emerges only through fantasizing. And this pathway, I think, is necessarily circuitous. And I think one, if, if a fantasy just gave us direct access to an object, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't give us enjoyment. And I think there's a nice moment in the film when Harry met Sally that shows the, the way that fantasy works. So Harry describes a dream that he had, which is full of fantasy. And then he asks Sally what her fantasy is. And she says, well, my fantasy is a guy comes up to me and rips off all my clothes. And, and then Harry goes, and then? And then that's it. And, and he goes, well, <laughs> she goes, well, sometimes I vary it up. Like he's, he's sometimes wearing a different, wearing something different. So, so the, the point, what makes that funny is it's not a really effective fantasy and it doesn't seem like it's very enjoyable because it doesn't have this detour that I think fantasy always needs, the circuitous route. So this is, this is I think, so, so this is, I think, what's crucial about the structure of fantasy. So if fantasy just gave us what we wanted, it'd be over and done with too quickly and it would remain unsatisfying like this fantasy of, of, of Sally or, or Meg Ryan and When Harry Met Sally. So this is why I think you can, we can imagine fantasizing about famous actors like Denzel Washington or Charlize Theron rather than our own romantic partners. So it's the, the difficulty or even the impossibility of hooking up with the famous actor that makes them makes the fantasy something enjoyable about it. So if one could easily enter into a romance with either of these people, then you wouldn't waste your time fantasizing about them. And we can imagine that their own romantic partners don't fantasize about them, I think. So the celebrity in this case functions as an implicit obstacle in the fantasy that renders the star a figure of enjoyment. So the, the, the star becomes enjoyable in a way that they wouldn't because of this obstacle that the celebrity poses to accessing the star. So it's always, I think, the obstacle to the fantasy object that makes the fantasy object desirable in the first place. And I think this is a crucial thing. So even though fantasy seems to involve pleasant objects, it's only the, obstacle that elevates the pleasant object into something that gives us enjoyment. So fantasy depicts always, I think, depicts a subject as lacking and then as subsequently overcoming that lack by overcoming the obstacle that bars access to an object of desire. So I might, for instance, overcome the fame of say Denzel Washington and obtain a date with him although he's, there's other obstacles, he's married, I'm married, all kinds of obstacles. So this type of scenario unleashes an enjoyment that's impossible outside the fantasy structure. So without the fantasy, you just, you just couldn't have it. So what's crucial about the fantasy, I think, is the site where the enjoyment that it produces is. And so the subject, what's interesting, I think, in fantasy is the subject fantasizing doesn't enjoy access to the object, but actually 
encountering the obstacle that makes the object of desire desirable in the first place. And this is why fantasy narratives, I think, spend so much inordinate amount of time, really, with the obstacle and so little with actually obtaining the, ob the object of desire. And if you think about any Hollywood romantic comedy, you see like the, the, the amount of time spent with the obstacle to the romance is the really the lion's share of the film. It's almost like the directors to compete to see how little time can I show at the end where the person really gets the object of desire because the whole point is the obstacle. So fantasy's focus on the obstacle, which I think is otherwise kind of politically ambiguous because I think it can go either way. Actually, I think it's what makes fantasy a fertile ground for racism. So. Although racism is found in a lot of different fantasies, there can be fantasies that have racist, racist uh, elements to them, of course. My claim is that I, there's one fundamental racist fantasy and that we can see evidence for this fantasy across different historical and cultural divides. And this fantasy manifests itself throughout the modern universe. I think it's a specifically modern fantasy, uh, even in places where we wouldn't expect to see it. So I think it has different contents, but the basic structure or form of the fantasy, I think uh, is, is pretty much the same. And I think this racist fantasy, like all fantasy, it has three primary figures. So first it has the subject, then it has the object desired, and then it has the obstacle to that object. And so even though it seems like the, the, the object is what is what the subject desires to obtain, actually, What's interesting is the object is really unimportant in the fantasy. The only significance that the object in the racist fantasy has to have is that it's unattainable. So it's unattainability is what makes it desirable and it's unattainable precisely because of the role of the obstacle. So unattainability is initially what kickstarts the subject's desire. So without that unattainability, there wouldn't be that desire. But what characterizes the racist fantasy, I think, is and what differentiates it from other fantasies is that the obstacle to the object is the racial other. So this is what the racial other is responsible for barring the subject's access to this unrestrained, unlimited enjoyment that it identifies with obtaining this desired object. So every fantasy has an obstacle. Just I gave these examples of the romantic film and the dating the star. Every fantasy has an obstacle but a fantasy becomes racist when it places a figure of the racial other in the position of the obstacle. And I think this is what differentiates the racist fantasy from say a homophobic fantasy. So the obstacle in the, is in the racist fantasy has to be the racial other. And it's the racial other's difference from the subject of the fantasy that's crucial because it's this difference that actually enables the racial other to act as a barrier to what the subject desires. So without the difference, there wouldn't be this function of barrier that creates this possibility of unattainable enjoyment. So the fantasies, the, in the racist fantasy, the key player is the racial other and functioning as an obstacle, this figure gives the desired object a sublime value that it otherwise wouldn't have and thus provides in a way, I think, the subject access to an unrestrained, unlimited enjoyment that it otherwise wouldn't have without this racist fantasy. So in other words, just a couple examples. So white Southern womanhood would just be banal without the threat fantasized that's posed to it by black masculinity. Germanness would be impossible to enjoy without the menace, fantasized menace of the Jew. So the obstacle introduces scarcity into the fantasy, scarcity produces value. So as the fantasized obstacle to complete enjoyment, the racial other is actually responsible within the fantasy for the subjects and the society's failures. So fantasy is a way actually of, of pushing responsibility for failure and for enjoyment onto this figure of the racial other. So the presence of this figure in the fantasy is what gives the racist fantasy, it's racist hue. The fantasy defines the subject through the racial other that threatens it, which gives both the subject and the object a wholly secondary importance and, and almost insignificance in the fantasy. So it really stands out is that it's the obstacle that matters. 
subject to object, they kind of fade away. They're not really what's important. So all the attention of the fantasy and the, and the site of enjoyment in the fantasy is on this obstacle that is the racial other within the racist fantasy. So the structure of the fantasy, and I think every fantasy focuses on the obstacle. So in this sense, the racist fantasy with its emphasis on the racial other is the obstacle barring access to the desired object is not, it's not exceptional. It's only exceptional insofar as it places this racial other in the position of obstacle. So other fantasies don't partake in the racism of the racist fantasy, but they, I think, do share this preoccupation with the obstacle. And I don't, I, I don't know, maybe someone in the afterwards wants to give an example, but I, I can't really think of an example of a fantasy that doesn't have this emphasis on the obstacle. So the obstacle is not just, because it's not just an obstacle, it's also the site of access to enjoyment that would be impossible with it. So the point of the fantasy is not really, I don't think, to carve out a path to the object, but instead it's to create an obstacle to, for the object that produces enjoyment for the subject. So in the fantasy, we actually enjoy not having the object because this is how we experience the object as valuable. So it's only insofar as we don't have it that it has the value that we attribute to it once we get it. This is why the end of the fantasy is always short and it's always anticlimactic. So what one doesn't have can transcend, I think, the realm of what merely is, which is why it opens up this possibility of an enjoyment beyond the limit of what is. So the very fact that it's off limits, that it's inaccessible, that's integral to the enjoyment that gets produced. So that's why it's the obstacle that's actually producing the enjoyment in the fantasy. And I think, to me, the crucial thinker in uncovering the importance of the obstacle for our constitution of both ourselves and the world is, is Johann Gottlieb Fichte. And I think Fichte doesn't get a lot of attention, uh, but I think he, he maybe should get a lot of attention. So Fichte follows closely on the heels, he's a German idealist following closely on the heels of Immanuel Kant. He's really just trying to work out, develop Kant's system, but he, he look, pays attention to certain problems that Kant leaves open. And in doing so, he actually discovers the significance of the obstacle within the path of desire. So Fichte, he, unfortunately he didn't read Freud. Uh, so he doesn't, he doesn't theorize fantasy, but I think his thought actually has clear implications for how we conceive of the role of the obstacle in fantasy. And I think this becomes nicely apparent in his major philosophical work, the Wissenschaftslehre, which is unfortunately translated as the science of knowing. And if you know German, you'll know that's a, kind of a disaster. So uh, maybe it should be something like doctrine of science or something. Um, but once it gets, as everyone knows, once something gets translated in a bad way, it sometimes sticks. So in this work, Fichte argues that we create ourselves and we create the world through what he calls an act of self-positing or self-determination. But the key thing for Fichte is that this self-positing always encounters an obstacle that, I love this point, that both limits it and then drives it onward. And this, op so, so for Fichte, the obstacle is simultaneously an impetus. And so without the obstacle, Fichte thinks, our self-positing would lack any incentive to develop and keep going, which is why the obstacle is also an impetus. And Fichte has a term for this in German called anstos, and, and which is convenient because in German, anstos means both obstacle and impetus. And I, I, it's hard to think like the, the translators of this work, you feel a little sorry for them because no English word manages to mean both things, but the word they chose is check, which is again, maybe unfortunate. They could have maybe come up with something better. But this ambivalence of the German word anstos, I think serves Fichte's purposes really nicely because it enables him to register the fecundity of the obstacle. And I think that's a that idea that the, the, there's a fecundity of the obstacle, I think that really provides a crucial way to get into understanding how fantasy and then ultimately racist fantasy functions. So this anstos or obstacle marks the point at which the fantasy blocks access to the desired object and simultaneously makes access possible to this enjoyment. So it's the, again, this, this obstacle that's also impetus at the same time. So the obstacle in fantasy is precisely what provides arousal or impetus 
for the subject fantasizing. So when we look at fantasy, we should always, I think, regard the obstacle in the fantasy through the lens of Fichte's term instos, that the instos prohibits the subject from attaining the desired object, but at the same time, it actually entices the subject by opening up this enjoyment that would be impossible without this obstacle or impetus. So the fantasy object could be anything, right? It could be a commodity, it could be a lifestyle, it could even be a type of social status. That's what I used to fantasize in high school, <laughs> which is pathetic. Uh, but whatever it is, this fantasized object promises a kind of unrestrained enjoyment for the subject. So every fantasy, I think, aims at an object that withholds within it some secret of enjoyment for the one caught up in the fantasy. And the fantasy narrates the passage that the subject takes to this object of desire. And what's interesting, I think, for one caught up in the fantasy, as a person fantasizing, the object appears to have the ultimate importance. This is what I want to get to. This is what, this is, this is what I get to, get to this that I enjoy. But it seems like the, the object is the nodal point of the fantasy. But I think despite this belief, the actual object of desire in the fantasy has no importance whatsoever. It's absolutely indifferent. So we invest ourselves in the value of fantasy objects and we believe them to have an intrinsic worth. And this is why I think we, fantas we think we fantasize about them. But my point is that the fantasy object has its worth only in regard to what is blocking our access to it. So in, in fact, I think the, the causal relationship between fantasy and the object is the opposite of what we imagine. We don't fantasize about the object because of its importance. It has the importance that it has because we fantasize about it and because our fantasy places an obstacle to that object. So fantasy renders ordinary objects into object of, of objects of desire by making them unattainable. And this is, I think, the magic act of fantasy. And it performs this magic act through the erection of, sorry, sorry that sounded sexual, so through making an obstacle, right? And the obstacle transforms the ordinary object into a site of unrestrained enjoyment by getting in the way of access to it. So it makes it unattainable and thus makes it possible. So the object becomes just out of reach, thereby making this unrestrained enjoyment, which is otherwise impossible, seem possible for the subject. So even though fantasy shows the subject deprived of its object, it does nonetheless makes the object seem possible by prohibiting it. So, it, so fantasy in a way, you might say, prohibits what's impossible and thus makes it seem possible. So outside of the fantasy structure, the su subject simply confronts this traumatic impossibility of desire, but fantasy makes that seem possible. So the obstacle, in other words, creates the illusion of a possible realization of desire that would be unthinkable without this obstacle as that's also functioning as an impetus. So the basic lie, I think, of fantasy is that desire can be realized, that we can get to this ultimate point of satisfaction. And the structure of desire distinguishes, I think, between sustaining satisfaction through relating to the object from a distance and this impossible realization that fantasy proposes of actually getting to the object. And if we ever actually got to the object in real life, we realize the inherent failure of the object to provide promise satisfaction. Like when you drive the new car off the lot, you're like, oh, it's just an ordinary the car. I, how disappointing. So obtaining the desired object always has this effect of deflating the object. I like this idea that, that when you drive the car off the lot, it loses $2,000 of value just instantly. You've passed the thing. And I think that's a perfect example of the way, even though, okay, it's enmeshed in capitalism and all that, but I think it really captures the way in which realizing desire subtracts value from the object. So in this sense, I think outside of fantasy, one cannot obtain the desired object without at the same time eliminating what makes it desirable. So fantasy, fantasy actually rectifies the impossibility of desire through this obstacle that enables desire's realization to seem possible. So, so fantasy possibilizes, I would say. So in this sense, I think fantasy is trying to make create the possibility of a satisfaction that would otherwise be impossible. And this process enables one to enjoy the obstacle while believing that one is enjoying the prospect of the desired object itself. And I think that's the crucial thing, that what you're really enjoying in the fantasy is the obstacle 
not the desired object. So the appeal of the racial other in the fantasy is inextricable from the threat that it poses. So it's the racial other is generating enjoyment through the threat that it poses to the subject, through the obstacle that it makes to getting the object. So it's an it is that is an obstacle, I think, that the that race operates for the subject. And this obstacle is at once an impetus. So it's the fictian anstos, obstacle and impetus at the same time. So the racial other in the in the racist fantasy bars the subject from enjoying the object by monopolizing this object for itself. And in this way offers the subject access to this enjoyment that it otherwise wouldn't have. So, so the, illiter the illegitimate enjoyment in the fantasy, illegitimate enjoyment of the racial other occurs at the expense of the subject in the fantasy, but the subject actually enjoys through this other and finds the key to its own enjoyment through the enjoyment that it imputes to this racial other. So I'm gonna, this is pathetic, this example, but I think the example is so perfect. I, I hesitate to use it, but because it comes from, it comes from Mein Kampf. So Hitler provides, I think, a paradigmatic version of the racist fantasy. One that exposes, I think, the role that the racial other has in monopolizing the object for itself. So this is a point, uh, it's a point in, in, in the book where he describes a Jewish youth uh, seducing a, a young German girl. And this is what he writes. It's stunning for its revelatory power, I think. With a satanic joy in his face, the black haired Jewish youth lurks in faith for the unsuspecting girl whom he defiles with his blood. With every means, he tries to destroy the racial foundations of the people he has set out to subjugate. So in his fantasy structure that a lot of Germans bought into, Hitler figures the Jew as the one who accesses this privileged object, the German female, and thereby, thereby bars the German man, German men, from this object. So the racial other is able to experience what Hitler himself calls a satanic joy, that is a joy off limits to everyday Germans. And the Jew provides for access for Hitler to this illicit enjoyment. So as a result of this fantasy, the Jew actually provides the paradigm for Nazi enjoyment, figuring a way for the Nazi to enjoy through the obstacle to enjoyment or through the obstacle to the object of desire, which is again, this indifferent German woman. So through the fantasy, Hitler and his followers can experience the satanic joy that they fantasize being monopolized by Jews. And by appealing to this fantasy, Hitler was actually able to mobilize the entire German nation in his project. And the fantasy and the possibility for unrestrained enjoyment that it promises, I think has incredible mobilizing power we're seeing it today, a power that completely outstrips the self-interest of those caught up in it. So the racist fantasy I think has been successful because it offers people a clear reason, one, for why they aren't enjoying in the way they imagine they could. And it offers them a path to actually accede to this unrestrained enjoyment of the racial other that they think that they could get through the figure of the racial other, they think the racial other has. So, Although Hitler, he clearly states this fantasy and seems to be conscious of it. What's of course unconscious is the relationship that enjoyment in the, the relationship to enjoyment that the fantasy maps out for him, right? So Hitler cannot know, obviously, so long as he remains Hitler, the anti-Semite, how he enjoys through this satanic joy of the Jew. In other words, he's an anti-Semite insofar as he refuses to take responsibility for his own enjoyment, insofar as he locates this enjoyment in the figure of the racial other, the figure of the Jew, right? So the step out of the racist fantasy occurs when one sees the enjoyment that one experiences as one's own and, is, and ceases associating it with the racial other. So this idea of taking responsibility for one's own form of enjoyment, I think is absolutely crucial in the struggle, anti-racist struggle, struggle against racism. So the racial other always has an enjoyment advantage in the fantasy, deriving from this fantasized racial inheritance, as I think is evident in this example. So in the fantasy, it, it's a, often a genetic gift, like athletic ability or intelligence, but what makes possible its victory over the subject in the fantasy is not just this genetic or cultural inheritance, but also the other's willingness to bypass the restrictions that the subject observes. So, so the, you might say that in the, in the arena of sex, the racial other cheats. So that gets an advantage that 
in the fantasy, gets this advantage that the subject wouldn't have for itself. So the figure doesn't obey the con social constraints in the way that the subject does. And as a result, the racial other uses seduction and ultimately has recourse to violence to enjoy a way in, in a way that the subject can't. And I think it's obviously this is evident in, in Hitler's anti-Semitic rant from Mein Kampf and the violence that Hitler unleashes originates, I think, in this fantasized vision of the advantages that the Jew has when it comes to sexual relations. So the racial other's sexual enjoyment is, I think, what gives racist violence its ferocity. And it's a ferocity driven, I think, libidinously. I think it's I think that's it's incredibly important to think about racist violence as libidinous violence and not and, and not separate from sexuality. So the, from the perspective of the fantasy, extreme violence is necessary to combat the excesses of the racial other's enjoyment advantage. But this extreme violence doesn't just combat an excess, it reproduces it in the guise of eliminating it, which is why it seems like the, when we see racist acts, it seems like the racist is really enjoying what they're doing. And they, they are, because they're getting off on this excess that they're attacking. So the racist subject feeds off this enjoyment that it imputes to the racial other in the fantasy, especially when the other, the racist, sorry, the racist is destroying the other. So the victim of racism, we might say, suffers for the crime of serving as the site of enjoyment for the racist in the racist own fantasy. So it's a phantasmatic crime. So the aim of the fantasy, it's a production of enjoyment, which it accomplishes through this vision of the racial other. So the racist fantasy locates enjoyment in the, raci in the racial other that both blocks access to the object and blocks the subject's path to the object. So this blockage again is the key, I think, idea. And so what's interesting is despite reviling the racial other, this, the racist subject must unconsciously identify with this figure's enjoyment in order to access it. So this is why that I think this explains a lot of the sometimes seemingly strange behavior of racists relative to the racial other that they otherwise despise. There's a there's this thing, there's a kind of identification that has to be operating phantasmatically. So in the racist fantasy, the subject, I think what's key is it doesn't recognize itself as the one enjoying. So the racist fantasy, it has to be structured around the racial other monopolizing this enjoyment for itself. So the subject experiences this enjoyment as other and doesn't realize that it is properly its own enjoyment. So the fantasy doesn't go on to depict the subject regaining the enjoyment that the racial other has taken from it. In the fantasy, the subject is just a victim, primarily in the racist fantasy, deprived of enjoyment. And the racist subject enjoys through this victimization, fantasized victimization. So the, the subject's enjoyment through this fantasy, the racist fantasy is parasitical, necessarily parasitical. And I think the privileged role that the racial other's enjoyment plays in the racist fantasy life becomes clear if we look at, uh, if we look at illicit sexual practices. So in, in his autobiography, Malcolm X describes, it's early in the autobiography, describes his days working as a pimp in New York City. And what it's interesting because he constantly, he says, I constantly, he doesn't say I was constantly bombarded by the racist fantasy, but that's what he describes. Here's what he writes. He says, in all of my time in Harlem, I never saw a white prostitute touched by a white man. Instead, white prostitutes played the part, this is my version, uh, of a desired object in the racist fantasy. And then this is Malcolm X continuing. They would participate in the customer's most frequent exhibition requests, a sleek black Negro male having a white woman. So by watching the black man enjoying the black woman, the white man partakes of the black man's enjoyment of the object, which is the only enjoyment he can access. So the white man phantasmatically imputes an excess to the black man in what Malcolm X describes that enables this white man to be himself excessive just through watching the other. So this ostracized position that the black man occupies is what enables him for the white man to be the site of enjoyment, to be this obstacle. So Malcolm X, I think, provides a perfect description. And again, we see the sexual dimension of it, of the contours of the racist fantasy. So white customers 
white male customers pay to watch a black man having sex with a white woman because the black man's enjoyment outstrips anything they themselves would be capable of. So the white woman genuinely becomes desirable only when the black man is having sex with her. So outside of this phanta phantasmatic relationship, she's just an ordinary object. So black enjoyment actually elevates her out of her ordinariness. So the behavior of uh, white men visiting prostitutes in New York, I think stems from the same position as Hitler's horror at the satanic joy of the Jews seducing German women. So even though Hitler annihilates Jews rather than paying to watch them have sex with German women, I think the fantasy, the form of the fantasy is the same in both cases. So the point for both is to discover an unrestrained enjoyment that they can't have without the racial other. So they look the, to the other to have what they can't have for themselves. So I think there's a remarkable, and again, hor another horrifying incident, uh, a case of this that occurred in France in, tw in 2016. So French authorities had just passed a law banning the burkini, which is a form of beachwear for uh, Islamic women that covers the entire body and the head. So the burkini, so the authorities argued, it violated French laïcité, the, 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 uh, the laws for the lay society. So the restriction on public, this is a restriction on public displays of religious clothing and symbols. So keeping the burkini off French beaches was a way of, they thought, keeping a certain element of religion out of French public life. But what's interesting is it gets the, the, the way that the law manifests itself is in a racist form. So uh, the French police uh, arrested a woman wearing a burkini on a Nice beach in 2016, and they forced her, it was a fascinating thing because they forced her to partially remove it. And the event made headlines around the world, That's how I heard of it. Uh, whereas decades ago, authorities would force women to cover themselves on beaches. Here they're demanding that women take their clothes off. But unlike the bikini, the burkini offended the police precisely because it entered into their phantasmatic scenario. So they could walk by thousands of women, even topless or in scantily, uh, attired bikinis without arousing their fantasies. But one burkini triggers the racist fantasy. So the law enabled the police to tell themselves, okay, I, we're just doing our duty. We're just enforcing the law. But the fact that it took four officers to prompt this middle-aged woman to take off part of her burkini indicates, I think, the psychic disturbance that it caused. It, they, so they saw excess in the enjoyment. I saw, they, sorry, they saw the excess of enjoyment in the woman's excessive clothing. So it's interesting that even too, met, too much clothing can be a site of enjoyment just as much as not enough clothing. So I think that that's what to me is fascinating about this example. So the burkini bespoke the excess of enjoyment in the way that it covered the body too much, right? So it aroused the ire of these French police officers and French authorities that passed the law because it indicated the refusal of mostly immigrants, to curtail their enjoyment. So the fact that French society viewed the burkini as evidence of the Muslim women's capitulation to patriarchy actually contributed to the enjoyment that the authorities saw in this outfit. So the women clearly suffered from their, according to the authorities' fantasy, clearly suffered from their adherence to uh, their religion's dress code. And this suffering in the minds of the authorities, the French onlookers equaled enjoyment. So French society located enjoyment in the immigrant wearing the burkini. And this was the point, I think, at which French society capitulated to a racist fantasy. So by outlawing this type of clothing, the French authorities actually attacked their own fantasy, not, an, not a real practice. But this attack through the law didn't eliminate the fantasy, it just nourished it, persuading people that the immigrant women were the embodiments of obscenity an obscenity that actually manifested itself in going beyond normal modesty. So excessive modesty was the obscenity. So this, the historical situation in early 20th century Japan is obviously far removed culturally and politically from Germany in the mid 20th century and France in the 21st. And yet I think this, I wanna conclude with this an, an example from early 20th century Japan. So this, because I think this radically different historical constellation shows emerging the same form of racist fantasy. So we can look at, I think, a specific outbreak, 
outbreak of racist violence in Japan. People probably know what I'm going to talk about. Um, and we can take stock, I think, of how the racist fantasy functions in a totally different cultural historical situation where even different social rules are in play. So I think by examining the form that racism takes in this Japanese situation, we can recognize that racism is not just in the racist fantasy, it's not just a particular proclivity of white Americans or white Europeans, even though maybe they're the most conspicuous adherents and the one most, the ones most responsible, obviously, for keeping it alive. So September 1st, 1923, a violent earthquake struck Japan. This is the Great Kanto Earthquake. And it actually basically destroyed the Japanese uh, film production uh, system. And, and many films that were made prior to that time were, were lost. So Japanese silent cinema, basically, this incredible wealth of, of production just disappeared. Uh, so it, unprecedented destruction. And its violence really was had no, no equal in modern Jap Japanese society. Uh, but what's it, it, obviously this natural disaster didn't necessarily immediately imply a political one. So the destruction of the earthquake was was huge. It killed about 100,000 people and led to multiple fires that, that unleashed even more destruction. And these fires blazed throughout the next couple of days. And the fires actually triggered this reactionary political response triggered by, uh, occasioned by the operation of a racist fantasy. So no one thought to blame anyone else for the earthquake, although, you know, we have natural disasters now that people use uh, racist fantasy to blame people for. So but, but what's interesting is the fires provided the occasion for the racist fantasy to become activated. So they led to the slaughter of thousands of Koreans living in the area, even though there were only 20,000 Koreans living in the Kanto area at the time. So it's just that there's a fraction of the overall population. They became the targets for the racist violence because of a certain position that they occupied within the racist fantasy, that is, position of obstacle. So they were starting blazes that destroyed Japanese life and Japanese enjoyment in the fantasy, although no Koreans actually did start fires. So by managing to produce the Koreans as the enemy responsible for the damage of the Kanto earthquake, the Japanese populace, those responding this way at least, changed the political valence of the earthquake into a politically reactionary event ultimately. So despite the relatively, again, the relatively low number of Korean uh, citizens in the in the Kanto region, the Japanese population largely viewed the Koreans as intruders who were illicitly taking jobs, wealth, and even women from Japanese society. So they had a lowly status within Japanese society. As a result, these Korean workers were figures of non-belonging. They did not belong to the society. And, and this made them easily occupying this position of obstacle or figure of enjoyment. Right? Those who don't belong can easily be elevated to this figure of, of a thief of enjoyment. So a significant number of, of Japanese citizens saw Korean workers through this structure of the racist fantasy. And according to this logic, through their enjoyment, these workers were an obstacle to Japanese enjoyment. And it becomes clear, I think, if you look at the type of rumors that swirled about the Koreans just in the days following the earthquake. So these rumors, I think what's interesting about rumors as such is that rumors reveal fantasies rather than facts, right? So rumors that gain social currency are the ones that resonate with the ruling fantasy space. And if they didn't resonate, no one would believe them, they'd quickly die out. So if I started to, if I tried to start a rumor that didn't fit within the larger fantasy space, no one would believe it. But because it does fit, it does, it is believed. So unfortunately for the Koreans living in Japan in 1923, all the rumors about them resonated with this racial fantasy. So for, for the Japanese subjects who participated in this massacre of the Koreans, the Koreans fit into the position of the obstacle within the racist fantasy. And according to this ruling fantasy at the time, they committed precisely the sort of acts that Japanese that, that obtruded Japanese access to their object of desire and thus blocked Japanese enjoyment. So for instance, there was, there's some of the reports at the time, widespread arson by Koreans, murders committed by Koreans, Korean poisoning, Koreans poisoning wells, Koreans organizing into, this is very revelatory, organizing into large groups to prepare for attacks on Japanese residents. So these rumors didn't just 
justify after the fact the massacre of the Koreans, they actually were the engine, the driving force behind it. That the racist fantasy actually, every bit as much as in in, in an act of lynching, every here, here, the racist fantasy is driving the violence. So the Koreans could play this role in the fantasy because again, because of their position within Japanese society that they belong, that, sorry, that they don't belong and their non-belonging placed them in this position to block Japanese access to the desired object, which would be prosperity or survival even. So after this world altering earthquake, everyday life itself could become an impossible desired object that they're blocking. I mean, we see this right now. I think that there's a, a fantasy that certain figures are blocking access to just being able to go around without a mask, right? Like that's the same the same kind of fantasy structure at work. So within the racist fantasy, the Koreans living in the Kanto region, they provide a visible barrier to this lost possibility of just normal everyday life. So Koreans were, Korean positioning within the fantasy even went further though, that they not only were a barrier to everyday life, they were the false rumor, one of the false rumors were Korean males were attempting, were raping Japanese women. And this is the, what was known at the time as the rapist myth. And it, it, it ensconced uh, clearly, I think, Korean men in this figure of the enjoying other, who's blocking, who's enjoying Japanese women in a way that Japanese men aren't able to. So this positioning, I think, is what occasions the brutal violence of the massacre that follows the earthquake. So the rapist myth, I think, plays a crucial role in understanding the massacre. And I think it again shows the sexual nature of racist violence. So the Japanese citizens involved in the massacre had to view the Koreans as sexual competitors who were illicitly gaining an advantage over them in order to even be able to perpetuate the killings. So because they saw them, as having this illicit sexual advantage, they were able to do brutal things that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do. So it's that, it's only when you think of that enjoyment disadvantage that you can, that enables you to do things that you otherwise would feel repulsed by. And I think that's what we see, at least in these acts of racist violence. And I think that's always the case with racist violence. So not only did Japanese citizens, military personnel, and even police officers kill Koreans wantonly, in this period just after the Great Kanto earthquake, they killed them with extreme brutality. So, and I think the brutality is what lets us know that we're dealing with enjoyment. So, you know, like the, the castration, the putting the balls in the mouth, like that kind of brutality says we're on the terrain of enjoyment. So excessive violence, I think, only arises when enjoyment's at play. So this is one account says, the killings were judicious, dismembering of body parts while dead or alive, disfiguring, death by torture, Many were put to slow, painful death, the process of which took hours or even days. So the excessive violence of the massacre is a response to this excess of enjoyment that the Japanese assailants attributed to the Korean victims. And the excess in the violence attempts to uncover and eliminate the sexual excess that's attributed to the victims, but it actually partakes of that. So there's a sexual, again, the sexual dimension to the violence. So we look at accounts of the violence of the Can Great Kanto earthquake and the massacre that, that entailed afterward, it becomes difficult, I think, to distinguish between, as I suggested, this assault between on Koreans and a lynching in the American South. The, the violence echoes, I think, across social and cultural barriers. And I think racism demands to be continually fed in order to produce this enjoyment that the racist always finds fading away with the elimination of the racial other. So there's this constant reigniting of it. And I think the, the key thing, I think, is this refusal to take responsibility for one's own enjoyment. And so I want to end with a, a, a joke about golf, which is not exactly an anti-racist joke. I think there are a lot of great anti-racist jokes, but this is, this is I think, if you, I think it will fit. It will, you'll see how this works and what I'm trying to talk about. So a guy golfing has a terrible round of golf, and, and he just really pissed as he gets to the end and and he finally turns to his caddy after he gets done with the 18th hole and he turns and he just he says you must be the worst caddy in the world he just blames the caddy and the caddy just doesn't miss a beat and says no that would be too much of a coincidence so i think to me that's the perfect antidote that joke perfectly captures the way in which racism functions that it attributes the enjoyment and the enjoyment of the failure even 
to the figure of the other rather than of taking of responsibility for one's own enjoyment. So I think racism ultimately, and this is what the racist fantasy shows, is the refusal to take responsibility for one's own way of enjoying to see the other as responsible for one's own enjoyment. So uh, obviously all enjoyment has to involve some form of the other. I think ultimately the responsibility for it resides in the subject itself. And I think that's what the racist fantasy and racism as such allows people to avoid. So racism's power wanes only, I think, when people take on the burden of their own enjoyment. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Todd. Um, I, uh, thank you, Todd, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, at this point, we do have um, a question. So uh, this question comes from uh, Charlotte and she asks, how could the structure of fantasy help us grasp the difference between racism and structural anti-Semitism if we take there to be a difference in the first place? Are they different fantasies? In which way? Uh, Moishi Pustoni, for example, uses the commodity form to conceptualize the difference. But racism, the racialized other, poses uh, an obstacle to the fantasies fully, uh, fantasies fully subsuming the body or use value under uh, exchange value. Anti-Semitism, on the other hand, fantasizes about getting rid of the abstract dimension of capitalism that it personifies in the Jewish figure. Hence the anti-Semitic imaginary of the Jew as the anti-race rootless hidden versus the racist imaginary of the other as a lazy body with only animal instincts. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, it's an interesting point. I think, and, 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 and I think it's why, you know, when people talk about racism, they tend to use the term the racialized other. And that doesn't, I think the interesting point is that does not apply to the way in which, especially anti-Semitism in the mid 20th century operated with the figure of the Jew. The Jew was not, the Jew was not racialized. The Jew was a, thought of as a non, I mean, this is, I think, Alfred Rosenberg, Goebbels, everyone, the, the Jew is a non-race, like the Jew doesn't have a race. So I think that's important, but I think I guess my sense is that they, the logic, the underlying, to me, the underlying phantasmatic logic of anti-Semitism is racist. Like I don't, I don't, I, un, I, I see the idea that the, of the difference, but I don't, and I think there is something to like that, that uh, anti-Semitism seems to be invisible, uh, that, that the other seems more invisible and that the, the racial other in racism seems more visible. I, I get that, but I think the underlying fantasy structure of the playing this role of obstacle to the desired object, I think it's the same. So I, I, I understand this is controvers controversial, but I, I do think it's the same. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from, uh, um, I apologize if I don't get your name right, uh, Isaac. Um, the question is, is the racist flaw more fundamentally a lack of true knowledge or an excess of false knowledge? I don't think it's a problem of knowledge, actually. Like, I don't think, I don't think, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to extirpate racism. Like, I think it's a form of enjoyment that comes in the stead of knowledge. Like, it, it becomes, it, it, the enjoyment that it provides is, comes precisely because the racist on some, in some way knows better. I think that, I think it absolutely, I, I, I am firmly convinced that you absolutely, there has to be this sacrifice of what you know in order to get that racist enjoyment. So, so I don't, I think the enjoyment comes at the expense of what one knows, like one sacrifices what one knows in order to enjoy in a racist way. So I, I, I yeah, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a lack of, I don't think it's a lack of knowledge, which I th which is unfortunate because I think the left likes to it likes to have things where we can provide knowledge to correct them. Even I, I mean, I'm doing it right now in a way, right? Like, like add more knowledge. That's how you. I mean, even the notion of class consciousness is let's get more knowledge. I just don't. I don't think it's a knowledge problem. I want to add to that a, a little bit, um, or or push you a little bit on that. Because yeah. I'm wondering if, uh, does knowledge play a different kind of role, do you think, in fantasy? Not necessarily as the aim of the fantasy, but as, as maybe part of the uh, scenario, um, as it were. Like, do you, can you think of instances where perhaps fantasy or uh, knowledge 
uh, operates in the fantasy, what the other knows. Uh, yeah. Is, is the yeah, yeah, no, I, Jamie, that's absolutely right, right? Like that, that, that the other's enjoyment is tied to a secret knowledge, right? So, so that, but that, but that secret knowledge doesn't exist, right? Like that's the whole point of it. Like it's fantasized knowledge. So it's not, I mean, I do, maybe there is something to, if you can, if you can add knowledge, if you can give someone knowledge about where the enjoyment is located within the fantasy, that maybe there's something disruptive about that that can break the hold of the fantasy has on you. Like, but I, 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 again, I don't know how you can get a person directly to that position because you can't just tell them. You can't just say, like, you couldn't just say to a Nazi, like, oh, you're, you're actually enjoying the satanic joy of the, G like, that's just not going to work. So I think that, I don't know. I mean, but I do think that there may be something in that, but I think your point about knowledge, the way knowledge is positioned. Absolutely. I agree with that. Great. So uh, Kaya asks in this framework, how do we explain settler colonial fantasy, a fantasy of absence uh, slash emptiness, untouched land, for instance, in Israeli and American settler colonial fantasy, would this not be a racist fantasy? In this case, isn't the form of the racial other more of a backhand one, invisibilized or overridden as opposed to being produced as an obstacle? What is the other in such a fantasy? Well, what, I think what's it, I think that we shouldn't, when people describe their fantasies, I think we shouldn't believe them, right? Like that's, all, that's the first thing I would say. Like if they say the fantasy, like, like, you know, like for instance, Hitler says, I'm going to exterminate Jews like lice. No, he wasn't. Like you don't kill lice that way. So I think we shouldn't, I think we should never. So I think this settler fantasy of like a virgin, the fantasy is never of a virgin territory. The fantasy is always, we have to clear out this to make, create a desired space for ourselves. So I think actually the indigenous population is functioning in the same way as an obstacle to this, to the enjoyment that has to, and, and if, the, if, the, if the settler, the colonialist says, Oh, it's virgin territory. I don't. I think psychically, it's not functioning as virgin territory for them. So that's what I would say. I, I mean, I, I I see the point. Like I see, maybe it could be different, but I I don't. I I think we shouldn't take them at their word when they say, "I want to." I'm operating on something that doesn't. That's that's clear. Okay. Uh, so now we have a question from Matthew. Um, is this structure of fantasy unique to racism or can it be applied to all types of reactionary discourse? I think of the right-wing discourse around trans women competing in sports as an instance of a forbidden enjoyment for cis men. Could this apply for sexism, transphobia, ableism, and other types of discrimination? Absolutely. Absolutely right. Exactly. So the only thing that makes it a racist fantasy is that the racial other gets put in the position of the obstacle. But exactly, like trans, you can see the same thing. You could see the same thing in terms of women, I think. So, so I think it, I think it, I think it does work. I think it, you could see it as a way that reactionary politics functions as such. I think that's right. That, that the, the, what makes it racist is just the fact that there's a racial other in that position. All right, this question comes from Klaus Melodic. Seems there are perhaps three questions. Uh, the first is, are racist conspiracy theories an extension and totalization of the racist fantasy you describe, or does the paranoia involved in conspiracy add another qualitative dimension or structuration to it? And the second question is, should I just go through all the questions first time? Can I do one at a time? Because I, I like I like this question a lot so far, so I don't want to I don't want to lose track. I'd probably forget to answer it. So I really like that. I think. Both. I'm going to say, I know I'm not allowed to say both things, but I think both. So I think on the one hand, it is just the same, but it is true that paranoia, it, 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 it notches up the, 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 the level of enjoyment on a fantasy, right? Like the, par the paranoid structure, because what it does, I think, is it makes, it, it creates a complete, it completes the network. It creates this other of the other who really has this who really is, is pulling all the strings. So it just, I think what it does is it extends that there, the, I mean, the relationship between fantasy and paranoia is, is I think close, but I think paranoia just extends that logic even one step further. So I would say, that's what I would say. 
Sorry, go ahead. Okay, so class, the second question is, how do we then best traverse the transgressive enjoyment, the obsessive preoccupation with the obstacle that undergirds racist fantasy? Yeah, I guess, I think this is a different, I mean, it's a huge question, like how does one solve the problem of racist fantasy? But I think the answer is to see that the, the obstacle actually inheres within the object itself. Like to me, that's the real step to taking responsibility for one's own enjoyment to see that like this, that I can, I can relate to this. Like, I think, look, I think there's a way you could even say in terms of like a long-term relationship, like you think like, oh, wait, I want to get hooked up with this other person who's, who's inaccessible and, and, and thus more a figure of more enjoyment. But what you don't recognize is that even in your long-term partner, there still is this part of inaccessibility that remains and that you have that, that, that form of enjoyment is right there present for you. So I think that's, to me, that's the key to see the way in which the object is already, it has its own barrier within it, its own obstacle already within it. And then uh, Klaus's last question is, if we decipher the universalist structure racist fantasy in the way Todd does with Lacan, does not the historical specificity of a given racist dynamic get lost? A little challenge for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I, I, I think that's true. But I, I think, look, I think the, again, I think the content is what's racially specific. I mean, sorry, historically specific, right? Or, or racially specific too. But, uh, but the form, I think, is is structural and 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 not particular. So, I, I I guess, yeah, I think there that is a risk. But I think in, I think it's helpful to understand. I guess I'm not sure what's gained by, by saying, it's always historically particular in every case, right? Like I don't. I'm not, I, I, someone would have to convince me what's gained by that. But I do think, of course, like there's like the content varies in terms of historical specificity. I just think the form doesn't. I'm gonna uh, skip down to, there were a couple of questions that snuck through in the chat box. Um, so, and I may have, or you may have already answered one or two of them, but let's just double check here. Um, David Kirkman asks, is Todd suggesting that all forms of racism involve fantasy of this kind? What about the racism of the colonists where the colonized peoples are considered inferior? Yeah, but I, here's what I think. Like, I think, again, I just would say, this is what I said about the, the, the virgin territory, right? Like every form of racism considers the other as inferior, but that inferiority, like, the thing is social inferiority corresponds to enjoyment superiority. Like that's the thing. I think that's to me the key thing. Like seeing, thinking that someone is inferior socially, ontologically, however, doesn't, that, that doesn't mean you think they're less capable of enjoying. It means you're more capable. They're more capable of enjoying. So I think that, that it's not, it's not like, like a, a the feeling superior doesn't mean feeling superior in capacity to enjoy. I think that it means actually feeling inferior in that way. And again, I think what people say consciously and what they unconsciously, the way in which their fantasy structures their existence, which we can see in how they act, because it's different things. But I would, I, I, Jamie, let me say one other thing though. I do think there is, I think there is also operative a racist ideology that says there's a certain racial hierarchy that exists, et cetera. Like I think, and which I don't think has, I think that's separate from this idea of a racist fantasy. So I don't think my claim would not be at all that all racism is reducible to a racist fantasy. No, I think there clearly is a racist ideology, but I think what's interesting is and lamentable is that as the racist ideology has seemed to have less hold over more and more people in the society, the racist fantasy actually has more and more hold over people. So it's almost like the, if the ideology gets combated, then the fantasy is strengthened in some way. So I, I, but I do, I do, I wouldn't say that all racism is just part of the race, part, is solely confined to this fantasy. I do, of course, believe in a racist ideology like this notion of the hierarchy of races. 
Wait, how do you understand the difference between ideology and fantasy exactly? That's a good, thanks for that question. I love that question. So, so my idea, here's, here's what I would say, that ideology gives us a way to understand our position within the social order, right? Like it, 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 it is the way in which we're symbolically situated, which means that our ideology forces us to confront the fact that we're lacking subjects and whatever the ideology is. What fantasy does, I think, is it provides us a way to overcome the lack that ideology ascribes and attributes to us. So that's that's the way I think they're different. So so ideology is a way of is a tie to our symbolic social position, and then fantasy is a response to that as a way that we escape the, the confines that, that of that of that position. Excellent. That's very clarifying. Um, Felicia is wondering how we are to think visuality and fantasy uh, together, particularly as it relates to anti-Black racism. If race is a kind of visual a regulation or regime, how does the seeing of race structure the fantasy and the enjoyment fantasy induces? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that the, the isn't the, isn't, I guess what I would say about this is that the, the, the it's own, like part of what the way that racism functions is race has to be made visible. Right, like that's the fantasy needs the visibility of race, and and I think that that's one way in which we can see the fantasy functioning. Just in, for instance, like I was just this room as I was thinking about this talk before, and I was thinking I, I don't know why I thought of it. Oh, I don't know why I thought of it, um, but I was thinking about the Time Magazine cover of O.J. Simpson during the O.J. Simpson trial, and he was he was incredibly. It was a very controversial because it was incredibly racialized, and so racialized cover and and what's interesting is just the very the very way that the picture was constructed was informed by the fantasy so i think even like the, even the regime of making race visible and noticeable is informed by that by that fantasy and it, and and vice versa right like the more there's visibility the more that feeds back into the fantasy so i think there's a a, a symbiotic relationship between those two Okay, um, how does the, uh, this is an anonymous uh, uh, question, how does the racial fantasy operate in the context of colorblind racism? Uh, that is, how do people who claim to be not racist still perpetuate this fantasy, even if they do engage in acts of racial violence? Yeah, I just think colorblindness is the main way it's perpetuated actually today. Like I think, I mean, obviously there's more obvious ways, but I think the primary way is I don't see race I'm colorblind. I, I, I treat everyone the same, right? Like that, again, that's the conscious position of the person, but then the unconscious fantasy is nonetheless operative. So I think that, I think that that's, it seems like to me, that's the perfect, that's the perfect subject of the racist fantasy is the person who consciously even believes themselves to be non-racist and colorblind, but that doesn't prevent them from the, the this fantasy having, you know, operating and, and, and controlling. And uh, another anonymous uh, question, how would you explain police violence under this paradigm? Yeah, I think police violence to me, I think it's inexplicable actually without understanding the phantasmatic role operative, right? Like that, that like why, I actually, this is part of a book project and there's a whole chapter on police violence because like how else to explain the excess of bullets fired, right? Like that, like incredible numbers of, or a guy's lying on the ground with his hands up saying, I don't, I'm not proposing a threat and he's shot. Like, right, like what, what must be operative there unless this figure is such, is a figure of so much enjoyment that bullet, one bullet's not enough to bring that enjoyment to a stop. So I think that, that to me, police violence is so wrapped up in that racist fantasy that that's exactly where that's, that's driving it. This, like that the figure of the racial other embodies so much enjoyment that it requires excessive violence to bring it down. Great, it seems we only have uh, one question left unless uh, someone wants to ask one now. Um, uh, this has been a great talk, a uh, very rich talk, and covered a lot of different uh, uh, bases. So um, thank you, Todd, and, and thank you for everyone who has attended the event. 
Um, it seems the last question, I'm not exactly sure, uh, uh, it's from Dan Levin. Um, uh, I'm, I'm guessing the question has to do with how do we then account for the conscious dimension of racism as opposed to the unconscious dimension? Yeah, no, that's a good, yeah, it's good. It's, it's good because that's true. Like, I think it's interesting that we're in an epoch where, not interesting, horrible, we're in an epoch where the conscious dimension of racism is actually increasing, not, not, not receding. And I think that the, that the two things aren't always necessarily apart, like the, that, that you can be consciously racist and still you're, you're partaking in this unconscious racist fantasy that at, what's, what's, I think what is even still unconscious, even for the conscious racist, is the way in which racism produces enjoyment. So that I think is something, so enjoy, I don't think enjoyment is unconscious. Like I think you're aware that you're, enjoying something. But I think what is unconscious is the, the, the connective tissue that connects what you're enjoying to a certain experience, right? So, the, so you think you're enjoying this other thing, but you're, what you're really enjoying is, for instance, like, I think even the, no conscious racist would say, for instance, like, let's just take uh, Donald Trump as a conscious racist. Uh, even Donald Trump wouldn't say, that he's getting off on black sexuality, right? Like that wouldn't be, like he wouldn't say that. So I think that aspect has to be unconscious. It, the, the, the connection has to be unconscious, even in these, this, this, even in this rise of, of conscious racism. Oh, another question just popped up. So this is about, uh, this is a Lacanian question. What, uh, what would be the function of the unary trait? Uh, for the racist as a unifying point to designate the racial up. So the unary trait of the, I'm not sure I understand because it's the unary trait of the racial other or of the subject? Um, maybe if the person wants to, to write a clarification. My understanding of the question is that, um, uh, uh, you know, how do you understand the role the unary trait plays in the uh, fantasy? Oh, okay, this person says, of the racial other yeah. What I'm thinking. So what is the relationship, I guess, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, between the, the racial other and the, and the unary trait in Lacan? And maybe you could also uh, uh, explain for people who may not know uh, what the unary trait is. Yeah, so unary trait is this, is this one signifier that organizes the, the entire symbolic subjective position. So I think that, 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 that what, what I would say the relationship is, is that the unary trait provides the anchoring from which the racist fantasy can function. Like it gives the, it, it gives an identity for the racist to fantasize about. Like it, it provides that point at which all these images can circulate around this particular signifier, this particular one, this particular idea. So that's what I would say that it, it provides like this, this nodal point, just like the, what the context of the unary trait does for any, for any subject, it provides us this point of, 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 of nodding where we see everything come together at that point. It certainly would play a, a function in racist groups as well, right? Correct, right, right. 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 They're trying to find, I mean, they're trying to establish themselves a, a unary trait to organize their, their, their symbolic position as well, right? Okay, well, uh, this has been an excellent talk. Thanks again, Todd, for, for, for your presentation. And thanks again to all of the uh, participants. This has been a very uh, enlightening um, uh, discussion. So um, again, if you are interested in uh, receiving a recording of, uh, of this webinar, please email me at uh, james.a.godley at dartmouth.edu. Thanks, Jamie, so much for having me. Of course.